and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Are you wondering if your binge or emotional eating habits have triggered hormone and gut issues? Low energy, fatigue, bloating, brain fog, weight gain, more PMS, more menopause symptoms, more cravings, poor sleep, the list goes on. Did you know some of your hormone and gut symptoms can also fuel your emotional eating behaviors? Yes, they can. That's why it's so important to address the roots of your physical symptoms while working on the emotional mindset and self-love work. If you're ready to address each piece, be sure to check out Amber Omaniac, emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert. With nine years of experience helping over 1,200 women with support on all of the above and without diets, without restriction or any quick fixes. Amber will do a full health assessment and help you get to the root of your symptoms with hormone testing, gut health assessing, and of course, support to help your body come back to balance with your mind and soul. Visit amberapproved.ca to book a 30-minute body freedom call or check out the No Sugar Coating podcast today to learn more about the connections between our relationship with food, mindset, and our health. So today it's me and I'm going to be talking all about identity and forming an identity, kind of clawing back an identity after you recover from an eating disorder. Now I am using the chapter from the mantra treatment model, which if you want to look out the book, it's called a cognitive interpersonal therapy workbook for treating anorexia nervosa, the Maudsley model by Eureka Schmidt, Helen Startup and Janet Treasure. Now this mantra workbook and this focus on identity is specifically written for anorexia nervosa recovery. However, I believe that it is very, very valid for all eating disorders. So when I'm talking today, I'm going to be like referring to the chapter, but I'm going to be also looking at the broader kind of eating disorders and applying these identity themes to all the eating disorders. So it's really relevant, whatever diagnosis you have, or even if you struggle with disordered eating. So as you begin to turn a corner in regards to your eating disorder and recognize longings to get more from life, you might find yourself wondering, you know, who am I going to be without this eating disorder? What will be left? How am I going to cope if the eating disorder isn't there? And you may have a real sense of fragility around your identity. And you might kind of think, oh, it's better to stick with the devil I know than to risk not knowing. And this can be especially true if the eating disorder was rife at a time when your identity would naturally be beginning to evolve. So often like during adolescence, or if you had an eating disorder for a long time, so it's reduced your life to a point where the eating disorder has become the biggest constant in your life. So I think particularly as well, if you go, if you develop an eating disorder through adolescence, that is the time when hopefully if you're in a kind of fully flourishing place, without a pandemic and all the rest that we've experienced recently, you would have the natural opportunities to be able to probably really engage in hobbies, go out with friends, go traveling, experience new things and begin to find out who you are. If you develop an eating disorder though in this phase, your life will have become really, really narrow. You will have missed out on so many things and the eating disorder will have really filled that void. So it can also feel terrifying if one of the functions of your eating disorder is to squash feelings. And this is because change necessarily involves some degree of uncertainty and upheaval. So it can feel a big leap of faith to loosen one's grip on the old coping methods and begin to trust in new ways of being. You know, it can really be quite frightening. 
So one of the things that we've often heard over and over from people who go on to recover from eating disorders is that a tipping point arrives when they realize they want something more than the eating disorder. So some examples here. Lucy desperately wanted to make it to university to study design. She knew she had a real talent and she knew she had a make or break summer ahead of her to get herself well enough to go. Otherwise, she would change the course of her life in a way she knew she would one day regret. Rhea had a wake up call when a friend of hers died young. She had a glimpse of the fragility of life and of time passing quickly, followed by a surge in her sense of wanting more from life. She looked on at herself and her situation and she decided that enough was enough and that she no longer wanted to be ruled by the eating disorder. So Rhea, for the first time, boldly asked for help and she embarked on psychological therapy with a genuine commitment and motivation. And with the support of her therapist, she went on to recover. Another example, Alan, a man in his 20s, had battled with body image worries and urges to restrict for a very long time until along came his baby daughter. Alan longed to be a positive role model for his little girl and he wanted her to look up to him and to be proud of him. Someone had come along for Alan who was more important than the illness and this reshuffled his priorities and made getting well top of that list. So obviously, like giving some examples here, and please don't think that any of these people then just found recovery, plain sailing and went off into the sunset. Far from it. You know, it's recovery is hard and there are ups and downs and setbacks along the way. It's all inevitable. But all of these people went on to recover and all of them said that they preferred their life free from the illness. They all set their sights on something bigger and better than the eating disorder, something that would not or could not be the same while the eating disorder was around. And these types of goals can mark turning points in your journey. And I think this is just so important. I think back to my own recovery from bulimia. And although in the darkest times, I never knew how I was going to be free of it, I had made a very clear decision that this was not going to be my life. And I had lots of hopes, lots of dreams, lots of things that I wanted to do in my life. And having that bigger picture, having something larger than the eating disorder was really what pulled me out of the depths because of I had something to focus on to go forward, something that was bigger and more appealing than the eating disorder. So That is often the way in, I think. When we're thinking about changing the next meal, changing about, I don't know, thinking about dealing with something tomorrow or this week, it's quite hard sometimes to get motivated. We need those bigger and brighter goals to propel us forward. So I'm going to talk as well about some ways that you can begin to shift your identity. And to do this, you need to step into a place of just being a bit more curious and creative and thinking beyond the eating disorder. And this gives you a chance to almost, to start to dream a bit, to start to think about what are the possibilities and what are the kind of good things that I could have in my life. It's almost a chance to give yourself permission, just to be bold, to be curious and to have a go. So one of the first little tools that you can use to just reflect on how much of your identity is taken up with the eating disorder at the moment is to draw a pie chart and think about how much of the pie chart at the moment, how much of it, how much of your identity is linked to anorexia nervosa or your eating disorder. So If you're in the depths of an eating disorder, it's probably very likely that so much of how you think about yourself, so much about how you judge yourself, so much about how you evaluate yourself is very much linked to controlling food, controlling weight, exercise, all of those things. 
So often when someone's in the depths of an eating disorder, it might be almost as though 90% of your pie chart is focused around those things. And your identity in relation to other things, such as relationships, study, career, spirituality, hobbies, it might be very, very small. But one thing you might want to think about is actually, how would I like my pie chart to look? You know, if I was kind of like thinking about having a balance in my identity, and none of us has a perfect balance, but what other things would I like to be in my pie chart? So maybe, you know, maybe weight and eating will still be in there in some shape or form. But what about your relationships? What about study, work and career? What about friends, family, travel, spirituality, hobbies, anything else, you know, How would you like your identity pie chart to look? And this simple exercise just firstly helps you reflect on where you are now. Secondly, it opens up your mind to expand and think about how you would like things to be, to think about the possibilities, to almost get your head above water and to realize that there could be another way of being. Also, what's so helpful to realize as well is it's very hard to win and feel satisfied with one's identity when there is so much focus on one area. Because even if you got the weight and shape identity box ticked perfectly, there's no such thing. It's kind of as though the goalpost will always move. It's very hard to feel a real sense of satisfaction. And we know people regularly say, you know, when I was at my smallest body weight, that wasn't the point that I found true happiness. You know, actually what makes people happy is life experiences, being connected in relationships, doing things, traveling, having a sense of purpose. All these things are much more important. So again, just have a think, how would you like your pie chart to look? What things would you include? And there's no right or wrong, we're all individuals here. So that's the first exercise. And to say with that as well, with, the second pie chart that you're drawing when you're thinking about different ways that you'd like to expand your identity it's going to be much easier to feel good when your identity is linked to a range of things so hard to win and feel good when so much pressure is put on one area of your life okay so that's number one exercise one okay the next exercise is to start to think a bit more about what was your healthy, flourishing self look like? If you have an eating disorder, you're not probably that healthy. You're not really very flourishing. Your life has become very small and you are probably in a bit of a tunnel and you're not seeing all the different possibilities. So a way into doing this is to start to think about who in your life comes to mind when you think of someone who has really made a go of life someone who lives life in a meaningful and nourishing way, someone who can be happy and content, but someone also who can accept and tolerate negative emotions. So we're not talking as well about some person perhaps on social media who you don't perhaps really know. Although I guess I wouldn't rule that out completely as someone to think about who has a full and nourishing life because there might be people on social media that inspire you. But I guess what I'm looking for here is for you to think about someone real, someone that you know, because the danger with social media is we see the kind of glossy perfect side, we don't see the darker side, which we all have. So think as well about someone you know who has good relationships and who holds principles you admire, someone who is their own person. So jot down the names of two or three such people. You could even like, you know, stick a photo in your journal or, you know, a magazine clipping of someone that really inspires you. So I would encourage you to choose people you know personally, but you could also as well, you can use a well-known person, a figure from fiction or examples of both because of Any of these different role models can give you inspiration and understanding about your own identity. So the people you choose may be quite similar to each other, or they may be very different, and they're likely to have good and not so good attributes. 
So it's important to remember that people are different and no one is perfect, because wouldn't that be dull? (laughs) Instead, we all have a mix of qualities and human feelings that ebb and flow and evolve with time. Even these people you like and respect have both strengths and weaknesses, and their personalities are not static. So if you think about the people you admire, what different strengths do they have? And what are the qualities they have that make them special to you? So you might want to just pause the podcast a minute and write these things down. Think about who is it in my life that I really admire and what are the qualities that they possess? What are the things that I really hold dear to me about this person or people? So when you do this exercise, it gives you an insight into the things that are important to you. It gives you an insight into who you are. And you might find that the people you've chosen are quite different. They might have different strengths, different weaknesses. They might be in totally different careers. They may be, yeah, very colorful and different individuals, but it doesn't really matter, okay? Because you're never going to want to be exactly like one person because you are uniquely you. And it can give you such an insight into something about yourself. So I'm just going to give you an example of someone who I admire. And this is someone who is in the public sphere. But I want to just use this as an example to show you that there are qualities about this person that I admire. At the same time, though, I would not want to be this person. And there are actually things about them that I probably don't admire so much. However, the things that I do admire shine a light even on certain aspects of my identity and what I find important. Okay, so the person I'm going to share with you is Dolly Parton. Okay, now just to say very much up front, I do not agree with cosmetic surgery. I mean, I'm not against it. I'm not going to open up discussion about this on the podcast. That is not why I am saying that I am drawn to her in terms of her qualities. It's not about an aesthetic thing. Of course, with all the work I do with body image, et cetera, (laughs) I would be an absolute hypocrite if I was sort of being drawn to her for those reasons. But the things that I am drawn to her about her are the fact that she is very strong minded, that she really is her own boss that she has creatively stepped out of her comfort zone, that she has gone against the status quo. She has really challenged things. She's really trusted in her own instincts, okay? So that, for me, shines a light on the parts of me in terms of the part that's perhaps a bit non-conventional, that wants to really step into my own place with my own values, with my own mind, and to be very aligned with myself. Okay, but on the other hand, with Dolly Parton, I do not aspire to change my body physically or to look a certain way. You know, those kind of values do not fit with me, but I can still learn something from realizing what I admire in her, but also realizing what I don't. So I suppose I just want to use that as an example. And I hope that's been a helpful example, but just to show in a way that our role models around our kind of values and the things we admire, it doesn't have to be someone that has it all together and who kind of ticks every box for us. There could be certain aspects we really admire. There can be certain aspects that we don't. Okay, so I hope that gives you a bit of an insight. So the last exercise that I want you to think about is to think back to when you were younger almost like pre-11 years old, before the world had put so many restrictions on you, before you had probably got into the whole academic system so intensely where there was a lot of pressure to be a a certain way, to behave a certain way, to be placating, to be a good girl or boy, to fit in, when you are more your natural self. And I'm realising that For some people listening to this, you might have not had a free childhood at all. And then it might be really difficult to think about these things. So if you are listening to this and you're feeling that way, you know, huge compassion to you. And you're almost going to be having to do this for the very first time and kind of reconnecting with your younger self. So what you want to think about is 
what did you used to really love? What did you used to really love before people told you what you should be doing to be good? So get back in touch with your passions. You know, what did you used to enjoy doing pre-11? Were you outside kind of doing outdoor stuff? Were you kind of drawing and being creative? Were you musical? Do you like hanging out with your friends? What did you really enjoy doing? Because I think our kind of pre-11 selves often give us quite an insight into what's important to us. Have a go as well at brainstorming the things and relationships that used to make me smile. Maybe make a collage of smile triggers. And I know when I look back on my life, there have been certain pivotal events, certain things that have happened with other people or places I've been to that really make me feel happy when I think of those memories. And I know I had quite a long period, probably from my sort of mid teens to early 20s, where I did have some of those experiences. But again, I was a bit in the tunnel of the eating disorder and I wasn't really engaging fully in life. So I want you to think outside of when you've had the eating disorder, what experiences, what memories, what relationships have been really significant for you? Because again, this gives you an insight into your true identity and who you are. The next thing, and please don't cringe with this, is just to make a lovability box, a decorated box wherein you place reminders of how lovable you are. So this might include postcards from friends, messages left for you, photos of good times and certificates. So collating them all together, I know upstairs in my drawer next to my bed, I have saved over the years so many of my special birthday cards, special postcards, special messages sent from friends. And whenever I'm having a sort out, I love looking through the drawer and looking at all the cards and it just makes me feel so happy and joyful to reignite all those little memories. The next thing is to think about the things I've never tried to do, but I've secretly wanted to do if money, time and responsibilities and other constraints were not there. So again, I think dare to dream. Now, I'm an absolute dreamer. I always kind of, some people would probably say I'm a bit too idealistic. You know, I'm always thinking of like possibilities and things that are beyond my reach. And I think it's It's so helpful because if we have dreams, we do tend to reach for the stars. We do tend to reach out of our comfort zone. And I know for me, so many wonderful things have happened from daring to think outside the box and things that I never thought were rationally possible, but have happened when I've opened my mind up to the possibilities. So make a list. What are the things that you've secretly wanted to do if money, time, responsibilities and other constraints were not there? The next one is think about your dream job. Imagine you had started work at this dream job and write a letter to a friend describing your typical week, how you're feeling, what you're doing and how you manage your off days. So again, dare to dream. Even again at this stage, if it feels completely impossible that you have no idea how you put this into practice, just allow your mind to be curious and creative and to expand. And finally, Make a list of hobbies you've been drawn to but have been too scared or unwell to begin and make a resolution just to start one of them with one baby step this week. Okay, so I hope that's given you a few ideas. I have to say, when I've just been talking about all of this, it makes me feel incredibly passionate and hopeful for anyone listening about making change and recovery And I think for me, it taps in so much for me into my own recovery and the things that really help me to expand my horizons beyond the eating disorder. So do go and get going with those pie charts. Have a think as well about people that you admire and starting to identify the values and attributes they have so that you can shine a light on your own identity And then have a think about those last few questions that I've just sort of put out there to you about sort of daring to dream, thinking about trying things that you haven't tried before, doing the lovability box. And you don't need to do everything, you know, just choose the things that really stand out for you. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and you feel inspired on your recovery journey even. 
and reforming your identity separate from the eating disorder. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you enjoy this podcast, I'd be so grateful if you'd follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.